Hi everyone, welcome to another Hatton's Model Railways live stream and today we're doing a real railway profile covering some of the most famous rolling stock in use in the UK and showing you some of the models that it has inspired as well. Now I know that a lot of you have been waiting for this one, we have had a lot of questions asking if we'll cover this class, so here we go. It's the class 43, it's the HST, it's the Intercity 125, whatever powerful name you have for it, it's an iconic design that's been in service in the UK since the mid 1970s. So we'll be covering a little bit of the HST story, which is a story that's still being told. We will cover some of the models that have been available past and present. And if you do have any questions regarding the HSTs, please do ask them in the chat and we'll answer them throughout the stream. As always with these profiles, we have to go back a little bit earlier than the, instruction, than the introduction of the HST to understand just why they were brought into service. And we go right back to the start of the 1970s on British Rail. Now, the railways were starting to lose a lot of express passenger services and customers to aircraft and other modes of transportation. So they really needed to enhance the services, add higher speed trains and bring the main lines up to the current standards of the time. The proposal was for the mass electrification of the British railway system, but that was hugely expensive and the budget wasn't really there for that at the time. So what they needed instead was a high speed, high power diesel express train. They did some research based on the Class 55 Deltics and other locomotives that they had in service at the time and figured out that they needed a high powered locomotive, but quite a lightweight one too, to haul these trains. Now, one thing they came across that was quite different to the services at the time was the ability to put a locomotive at both ends of the train. Therefore, doubling your power, but making sure that you've got quite a lightweight design of vehicle to haul these services. So two prototype units were built and introduced in 1972 alongside some of the new build Mark III coaches that were being set up to run with the new high speed train design. These were known as the class 41s and initially the class 252s as you can see on the front of the cab there. We can see the similarities here between this and the production class 43s which we'll get to very shortly. But these were immediately successful, first trialled on the Western region and then on the Eastern region of British Railways, looking quite different to anything that had gone before or since. <clears throat> so they were trialled in the early 1970s, an immediate success. They really found both the prototype power cars and the Mark III coaches were ideally suited to the job. So the design was upgraded and amended based on the research. The new body style was designed by a gentleman called Sir Kenneth Grange and the first HST power cars came into service in early 1976 with trials in late 1975. Initially, the vehicles were used on the Western region to replace some of the express locomotives there, including the newly transferred class 50s from the London Midland region and the Western hydraulic locomotives. So you'll have seen these running out of London Paddington right down into the west of England and into South Wales too. And they really did cause a stir at the time. They were then introduced on the eastern region. We see here one of the power cars at Harrogate. And in that 1970s era, you still had a lot of the steam railway infrastructure still in place. You can see some of the older style rail signals and lighting fixtures there. So these trains were completely futuristic on what was still a very steam era railway with a lot of locomotives and smaller unfitted freights running on the lines. These really started to transform the services along the lines. And I think Chelmsford Junctions saved it there. It's the train that really did save British Rail. They were immediate success. The prototype power cars achieved the world record speed for a diesel locomotive in 1973. I believe that was 143 miles an hour, only to have that record taken again by the actual production run HST 
later, and that was 148 miles an hour. And the HSDs still remain the fastest diesel locomotives in the world. They're designed to run at 125 miles an hour regularly. And a lot of the railways out there, even in the 21st century, still can't quite get to that speed. So the HSTs are designed for a really modern and futuristic railway. So as you can imagine, they started to take over even more and more services. And throughout the 1980s, there were further power cars and Mark Freeze built. Then for the London Midland region and the Scottish region of British Railways to join the Western and Eastern regions that had received them before. 197 of the production style power cars were built in total. And these were built from 1975 to 1982 at Crew Works. So heading into the 80s. The sectorization of British Railways made for a couple of different brand images and the trains were known as the Intercity 125, celebrating the top speed of the design. And a full brand new Intercity livery was introduced for the power cars and the Mark III coaches. You can see here the black alternating with the red stripe of the livery that you can see. This was then enhanced into the Intercity Swallow livery, which some of you have already spotted and was regularly used on pretty much all the regions of British Rail throughout the late 1980s and 1990s. Into the 1990s, we're going to lose British Rail now as the railways were privatised, but this really opened a door to a lot of exciting new operations and liveries. The power cars still reign supreme on the East Coast Main Line, working under the newly electrified system alongside Class 91s, with the Great North Eastern Railway taking the initial operations there. Over on the West Coast and the cross-country services, we had Virgin Trains who picked up their power cars. And you can see here just that initial transition period of the late 1990s with the power car repainted, but the stock still in that intercity swallow colour scheme. So heading through into some other liveries and one area we've not mentioned is the Midland Main Line, which again was transformed by the introduction of the HSTs running from London St Pancras to Nottingham, Derby, Sheffield and Leeds. This is still in place today, but these came in in the late 1970s, again replacing standard locomotives and coaching stock, transforming journey times and really pulling quite a few passengers back to the railways. So the HST story really carried on into the 21st century. There was still an immediate success. They were still being used by many operators, but they'd now been in service for over 20 years. The initial Paxman Valenta power units were starting to show their age. BR and a couple of other private operators had seen some success with different power units. A Merley's Blackstone power unit was trialled, but unfortunately unsuccessful. And the later Paxman VP185 was trialled from 1994. Some of those are still in operation, so they were a success, but they did move away from the Paxman designs. Indeed, a lot of the units were re-engined with MTU, let me just get the name right there, MTU 16V4000 units on the power units and they were put in from 2005 onwards, initially for First Great Western and then pretty much every other HST operator at the time did install these power units. I believe the last Paxman Valenta was in service until 2010 with Grand Central Trains and the iconic screaming noise that you did get from those locomotives is now only available in preservation. But the MTUs really did keep them there kept them in service and offered a huge life extension program. And we did see them come through and carry on with other operators. We see here Cross Country, who after withdrawing their HSTs in the early 2000s and concentrating on the Voyager trains, did get a fleet of the re-engined HSTs back into service with fully refurbished coaches, and they can still be seen today. And I thought I'd just give you a selection here of some of the very different liveries that have been carried recently by the HST. I believe this is a couple of years ago now, but from right to left, you've got the East Midlands Trains colour scheme as seen on the Midland Main Line. You've got the Virgin Trains East Coast livery. 
You've got the network rail HST in the middle, which is used for high speed track recording and maintenance. Left of that, you've got the Grand Central colour scheme, which is now replaced by multiple units, but the HSTs were in use with them at the time. And on the left is a first Great Western unit honouring the fallen soldiers of the First World War. And a lot of the first Great Western units that had been there since the late 1970s really began to receive these individual colour schemes towards the late 2000s. The story carries on even more and heading right through to 2020, there's still quite a lot of HST sets in operation with different users. Scott Rail has introduced sets running from Glasgow, Edinburgh and destinations further north, such as Inverness and Aberdeen. The Great Western region has retained some of their HST sets. These are now in shorter formations working in the west of England, but it's absolutely fantastic that after 44 years, these trains are still in operation in one of the first areas they were introduced, showing the incredible success of the HST over this time. A small number of them are now in operation with private operators too. And indeed, the first production power car, number 43002, has been returned to its original blue and grey livery and is rightfully now at home in the National Railway Museum, showing just how much of an impact the HST did have on the UK railway scene. As one of you mentioned before, it really was the train that saved British railways. And a little known side note as well, a number of them were built for the Australian market and advertised as the XPT services. The power cars being paired with Australian built coaches. And I believe there's still a couple of those in operation today. But if you know for certain, I'm sure you can put this in the chat and we'll keep an eye out for those Australian versions too. So that gives you a bit of a summary of the history of the HST. Let's have a bit of a look at the models. And with the introduction of the real life vehicles, both Hornby and Lima provided models in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, initially coming through in that distinct blue and gray color scheme with the Intercity 125 branding. Both of those can still be found in our pre-owned department from time to time and are a great way to get a budget HST onto your double O gauge layout. In more modern times, there are more detailed models that have come through, and these are some of the models that we have available today. So Hornby Super Detail HST has been around for about 10 years now, but it's still a really high quality model. They've tooled for a lot of different variations in the separate exhausts for the different power units, different variations such as the headlights on the front, which have changed throughout the 40 plus year career of the HST. I've got here the Intercity Swallow livery from the 1990s and another very recent release, the gloss green of the Great Western Railway from the early 2010s and onwards. Looking at Engage, Graham Farish did release a model for quite a few years, which has now been superseded by the fully detailed map depot model, which is fully digital ready and available in quite a few liveries, both now and coming through as well. In the spotlight here, I've got the latest East Midlands Railway livery for the power cars cascaded from the East Coast main line, which carried the original Virgin Trains livery, but with the East Midlands Railway branding, as you can see it there. So there really is a lot of models that are out there, whether you're a modeler right from the first days of the HST in the blue grey livery up to the Contemporary liveries, this is a full new 2020 release of a 2020 livery, so you can tell the full story of the HST through the models that are available. As ever, click that link in the description. I've put a link down there to show you all the HSTs we have right now and all the models that are coming through in the future too. There's network rail livery variations available in double O and Engage to take a look at alongside a lot of different liveries. And as I can tell through the chat here, the HST really did start to get its fans, especially over the last few years. The services that they have been withdrawn from have completely seen all over by enthusiasts. LNER and other operators painted some of the vehicles into their original liveries to commemorate the lives. And there are a lot of the colour schemes still out there. 
I believe there's a company called LSL who are painting those into the popular intercity swallow livery to work on private charter trains. So the story of the HST really is still going. After 44 years, as it's got to be the most successful British diesel locomotive design, it just still going. It's going to make 50 years and certainly a lot more on the side. And Chelmsworth there already mentioning the 40 years and saying he's been a fan right through. And you can just imagine sitting there in the 1970s on your still quite old fashioned railway and seeing this sleek, modern, completely different to anything you've seen before train powering past you at over 100 miles an hour. It would have been like nothing else you'd seen before. And that just shows how it really captured the hearts of both the enthusiasts at the time and the enthusiasts today, but also a lot of the passengers who really came back to the railways with the new levels of comfort and speed that the HST offered. Now, I thought I'd finish with something a little bit different than usual, because we always take a really good close look at the models. We always see some absolutely fantastic archive images that we put on the stream for you too, but we never really get to compare the size difference between the models and the real life vehicles. So. One of our staff members actually has a part of a HST that he brought in and let me put on the stream for you today. And just to show you the size difference, this is the piston and valve out of a Paxman Valenta power unit. So each power unit in the HST had quite a few of these in to make the HST move. And you'll see the size difference there. The power unit is about that large on the scale HST, but this is just one head from that power unit. So a little bit bigger, and it really does give you that sense of scale between the two different sizes there. But whether you are looking for a model or you want a little bit more history about the real life HSTs themselves that I have got a little, very little part of here, do check out that link in the description for more information. I've put some images on there too, and we'll flick again through those towards the end of the stream. There's more information on the models that are available right now in all the different liveries, all the different tech specs in there, the digital specs, the lighting specs are in there if you really want a model of one of these units. And if you are a modeler of the UK railway scene from the 1970s right up to the current day, a HST really does have a place on your layout. You've got to honor the absolute change that this made to Britain's railway system at the time. Initially being used on the western region, they were seen as far north as Inverness, as far south as Penzance, and at pretty much all the places in between too. So do have a look at what we've got. Kevin, if you have a look at the link in the description, you will see what we've got in stock right now and forthcoming releases in there too. All that information is on that link. So I hope you've enjoyed today's stream. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about the HST. As we mentioned, the story is still going with many of the power cars still in service with many different operators, some still in preservation at places like the National Railway Museum. And indeed, the story is still exciting and there's a lot more to come. So I can't wait to be telling the story of the HST on its 50th anniversary. In, nine, in 2025, shall we say, if a couple of years to go before that, but I'm sure the story will be just as exciting as this. Otherwise, I'll give you one last look through some of those pictures. I hope you've enjoyed today's stream and I'll see you again soon. Take care.